I'm uh, Alexander Wong. I'm a co-founder of Darwin AI, as well as I'm the Canada Research Chair in the area of Artificial Intelligence at the University of Waterloo. AI and entrepreneurship are probably two of the biggest topics in uh, Canada's, let's say, economic development and, and future economy ambitions. So I'm really excited to be talking about those things. What has been your experience at founding and then bringing an AI startup to scale? And what were your main challenges and how were they overcome? So for, for me, it's been a, a very uh, enjoyable experience or else otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. Uh, and uh, it just, it's just my way of trying to think of ways to contribute back to the, I guess, Canadian economy from an AI perspective, given that's where my expertise lies from a research. One of my main goals was how do I actually bring uh, research from my lab, especially in AI, into the field to benefit industry as well as uh, society. And so uh, there's been a lot of different challenges as you go, especially going from a startup and now trying to scale up. And uh, so, for, for example, one of the most obvious ones ha has been uh, dealing with the pandemic so far. And so uh, with the pandemic, uh, a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, business, uh, I guess, interests uh, change uh, as a result. And just getting the team, you know, still motivated to continue was was uh, very important. And so uh, one of the things that we, we did, and we actually used it as a way to give back to the community, has been on uh, the development of the COVIDnet initiative at Darwin AI, where we took our expertise in AI and we uh, created an open uh, source initiative for building deep learning solutions for helping to screen COVID-19. So that's one way that we uh, took the challenge uh, during the pandemic and used it as an opportunity to give back uh, to the community. Uh, another key one uh, about the whole uh, growing part is, as an academic, I'm very familiar with the technology. But at the end of the day, it's never about just the technology is finding a way to actually surface the technology in a form that has the most impact and utility to uh, you know, the custom base, the vertical that you're trying to hit. So that's been uh, actually an important challenge. And we, we received a lot of support from our uh, venture uh, funds that supported us with mentorship and so on and so forth to really help us hone in and identify one the best way in which people can actually leverage our underlying technology. Uh, another area that uh, was, uh, was a challenge as we continue to stick, scale up was essentially building the right team. So uh, early on, as I mentioned, as a professor, uh, my expertise has been on technology and innovation. It's not about uh, organizational uh, from a uh, operational day-to-day -day from a company perspective. So we had uh, wonderful people come in like Sheldon Fernandez with his uh, decades of uh, experience coming as CEO, or Ferrani uh, with his experience as COO. And now we continue to face the challenge of how to actually scale by hiring the the right people and finding the right talent, not just the right talent, but at the right time given the stage of our company's growth. And so we've been continuing to recruit a, a great talent to cover the different facets that allow us to grow in different areas. One issue we often hear about is tech adoption in Canada being low, certainly if you compare with the US or, for example, Asian countries. Um, is that something that you have faced and that you see as a challenge? And if you do, yeah. what are the solutions? How do we fix that? I do see it as a indeed a major challenge is technology adoption. Uh, with I guess uh, Canadian uh, ecosystem, Canadian companies, uh, even larger companies, there's always a hesitation to uh, adopt new technology uh, in the same rate as you know our you know U.S. counterparts or our European counter or even our Asian counterparts. And so one of the key things that I have seen, uh, I think, has helped a lot is with the Can a lot of the Canadian uh, government initiatives to help with the uh, technology translation. I think that's something that is a great start, but we need to push further. So for example, with the super cluster initiatives, where they're trying to connect uh, small companies, medium-sized companies, and large companies, as well as universities together, so that they could uh, have a technology transfer flow, so that they could actually benefit from each other, I think is wonderful, along with a lot of uh, programs such as, you know, the, uh, such as uh, NRC IRAP, there's the MyTex programs that help get, uh, I guess, uh, graduate students into the workplace to uh, for technology transfer and innovation. I, thought, I think those are great initiatives. Uh, if we could, uh, I guess, grow those and push those further, I think it would benefit us uh, significantly. 
Well, tell us a little bit more about that then. I mean, you mentioned the superclusters, you mentioned MyTax, which is the co-sponsor of this series that you're a part of. Uh, you mentioned IRAP. A lot of people talk about the SHRED program. Have you used those programs? What has been your experience and how can they be improved? Oh, yes. Uh, so we're involved with uh, pretty much all of the above. And I, I think those have been very wonderful uh, from my experience perspective. <laughs> For example, with MyTac, we've been able to get really, really wonderful uh, interns who are just really skillful. Uh, but uh, oftentimes, uh, there's a lot of things that we could offer from a company perspective to help them grow as uh, researchers, as well as grow as uh, individuals for joining the Canadian workforce. So for example, uh, while they're really great from a, a fundamental knowledge perspective, uh, bring a lot of new ideas and so on and so forth, there's always little quirks with actually translating technology from the lab to uh, industry. There are certain things that will work. There are certain things that in practical real world situations uh, might have uh, certain challenges, be it compute, be it cost, uh, be it uh, certain, uh, I guess, outlier situations that a lot of times academics don't think about. So that has been a wonderful experience for us to get, uh, be able to receive that knowledge and support from an innovation perspective while giving back to them to help them grow uh, to be uh, good individuals for the workplace. Uh, similarly for things like IRAP, similar kind of situation with uh, Supercluster particularly, uh, it's been a wonderful experience being connected to other companies who have uh, needs for what we provide as well as uh, other companies, uh, also other startups and scale-ups who face similar kind of challenges that we can actually communicate with. So I, I think it, those initiatives are great. Uh, I, I think the expansion of these kind of initiatives uh, would uh, really help uh, support uh, startups such as you know Darwin AI to uh, go a bit further. Especially uh, one area that I think could really grow is taking this kind of more from an international perspective. So with international exchange, I know MyTax does some of that, but growing that further so that we're working with you know, other uh, larger markets, uh, lar uh, other uh, countries that allow it to then share IP, share knowledge, as well as have our individuals kind of intermingle. Uh, we have certain great strengths, they have certain strengths. The, w the ability to share it uh, amongst the different companies uh, of different sizes, in different countries, I think would be a great way of pushing this. AI is, frankly, has become really a buzzword in, in Canada and around the world. And what I mean by that is that beyond what it actually does, people have these wild ideas about AI that are probably founded in some cases and completely unfounded in others. Is there a fundamental difference between developing an AI startup or an AI business and any other kind of business? For me, there's, there's nothing too fundamentally different. <laughs> At the end of the day, uh, one realization is, <laughs> I guess we uh, watch a lot of uh, sci-fi movies, <laughs> uh, TV shows, and so on and so forth. So a lot of times people think of AI as this sentient being. <laughs> and so they'll think, oh, you're running an AI company. So you're like talking, you're building, communicating with this AI being uh, to tell it, you know, okay, please help it with this business use case. Like, <laughs> That's not how it really works. Uh, the way you could treat AI is it's, it's, it's another software system in the loop as part of the larger workflow of your system. And so from that perspective, you could treat it pretty much as any other uh, software kind of company. <laughs> With the main difference there is the level of expertise necessary to build this underlying software is very different. Right, And the way with which you build it is also very different. So in your traditional software company, you would uh, you know, you know, write, think of an algorithm, uh, you would actually you know, code it up uh, based on procedures, put it together, the different components together. With AI, it's a, it's a lot more data-driven. And instead of actually uh, building, uh, I guess, algorithms, you're building fundamental blocks of a uh, AI system. For example, uh, we do a lot of deep learning. So essentially picking different uh, building blocks to put together neural networks and then coding it and building it with data in a way that it serves a uh, purpose to solve a very complex problem. And so the skill sets we're involved to do that is actually very different. But at the end of the day, once you build this AI intelligent system software, and the way you would treat it uh, from an infrastructure perspective is the same as any other software company. What advice would you give to yourself or to others 
at an earlier stage, sort of pre-scaling um, in terms of what's needed, what, what needs to be put in place so that you can successfully scale? I think uh, one of the key things that I uh, would have thought earlier about is uh, <clears throat> pretty much product market fit, right? Which is great. We have this great new technology, innovative, no one else has, great. But what can it do to serve industry? Right? That's the key thing I would tell myself. Think about that earlier. It's not just, okay, this is a cool new algorithm and it's going to make magic work for everybody. The, that's, that's, a, that's not a practical reality. At the end of the day, even with AI, you need to build it and tailor it in a form that people can see value. I think that's the key thing that I would have told myself as well as, I guess, other AI uh, companies. is It's not really about AI first. AI is a very important component, but it's about what you do with it within the grand scheme of things that becomes an enabling factor for industry. Like, what do you let them do? Do you allow them to automate certain processes that otherwise would have been uh, just left uh, untouched? <laughs> is it, do you help improve their overall workflow? Uh, but, and in, if so, how much uh, does it, for example, we do a lot of explainable AI. Does it enable you to gain new insights into your business processes uh, uh, for healthcare? Uh, does it give you new insights into diseases, so on and so forth? Uh, and again, it's very different from the academic uh, mindset of uh, being a professor. But I think if I had known that earlier, I think there are certain things I would do to either get the right context, the right resources, to be able to steer uh, from a solution perspective to uh, better cater to these use cases. Considering everything we've discussed today, your experience, the challenges you faced, the services you've used, and, and, and sort of the, the, the key lessons learned, uh, like the one we just discussed, uh, what would be your 30 seconds pitch to the powers that be, let's say to the government or to uh, academics or, or, or youth entrepreneurs, for instance, you choose, um, but to help Canadian companies scale up better and, 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 and faster? Uh, who would you pitch and what would you say in 30 seconds or less? Yeah, so uh, I guess uh, industrial leaders as well as uh, prime ministers and just essentially policy makers uh, as well as those in charge. It, what I would urge them to do is put greater investment in helping startups grow, either from a financial perspective, uh, connecting them with the right mentorship. There's been a really wonderful incubators uh, around. So, for example, we have experience with you know Accelerator Center, uh, Creative Destruction Lab, and so on and so forth. But being able to, but at the end of the day, right now they're all very strained in terms of the number of I guess uh, startups that they could help. There's only limited resources. To be able to grow those further would help significantly. And my other uh, I guess. Uh, I guess, uh, pitch is to continue to grow programs like the super cluster program, so on and so forth, to connect Canadian startups with large Canadian corporations. Because right now, as we just talked about, there's still this big hesitation to get started. I think getting started is one of the biggest barriers right now for uh, Canadian companies. So if there are initiatives, you know, funding resources and so on and so forth that allow a large company to work with a startup in a way that uh, allows them to share their technology, so something like a, a super cluster program, but beyond that, I think that would really help both the startups who are trying to scale up with their technology and just get the right revenue that they need, as well as the large companies that are, they know they need it, for example. They know they need AI, but they don't have the internal resources to make that happen, but they're always hesitant, uh, looking for that catalyst uh, to actually initiate this effort. I think these kind of initiatives could really help uh, the uh, startup scale up ecosystem. 